Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody this morning. Today we're going to be looking at the two covenants, the two main covenants that God made with mankind. We normally know them as the Old Testament and New Testament. But you're going to need your Bibles this morning because we're going to be doing a lot of reading. Now, God's covenants, of course, they reach far back into the early history of mankind. In fact, all the way back to Adam and Eve. What I want to do this morning is I want to look at some of the covenants that God made with people. And notice some of the characteristics of these covenants. Now, if you want to begin, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. That's where we're going to start. Genesis chapter 6. Here you have a covenant that was made with a man by the name of Noah in Genesis 6 verse 18. And notice what God told him. He says, But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. This covenant was made with Noah because of the obedience that he showed to God. Now the details are elaborated quite a bit later. Now if you want to go ahead and turn over to Genesis chapter 9. And we're going to notice verses 9 through 17. God again talks to Noah and he says in verse 9, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood." Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, this rainbow covenant is still with us today. Every time you see a rain cloud, oftentimes you will see the bow, the rainbow. This is God's promise. He will never again destroy the earth by water. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 15. We also find God making a covenant with a man by the name of Abram concerning the land. Now, notice Genesis 15 verse 18 it says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. But this covenant was conditional upon Abraham's continued obedience and the continued obedience of his seed. Now notice the stipulations given here. Let's go to Genesis 17 now. Notice the stipulations in Genesis 17, we'll begin in verse 1. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his, his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of these, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. 
Every man-child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations. He that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thine house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the circumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham because of his faithfulness. Yet the continued covenant with Abraham was contingent upon his sustained faithfulness in circumcising their children. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. We hear in Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 4, notice that God now makes a covenant with Israel. We see this in chapter 4 and chapter 5. This covenant, as all other covenants, are dependent upon Israel's faithfulness to that covenant and to God who made the covenant. Now, notice how chapter 4 begins in verses 1 and 2. Moses said, He's talking to Israel, says, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And this covenant contained commandments that the people were expected to keep. In fact, if you'll notice in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the next chapter, you see the Ten Commandments being given. Now let's go to the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. And we're going to notice something in Malachi chapter 2. We find a covenant that God made between man and a woman. In Malachi chapter 2, in verses 14 through 16, it says, The Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did, he not, did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith he hateth, putting away. That phrase, putting away, is simply meaning divorce. God hates divorce. And he takes very seriously the covenant that he makes between a man and a woman when they are wed together. You break your covenant with your spouse, you break your covenant with God. Now let's go to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Even while the covenant that God made with Moses is still well in force. God was already talking about making a new covenant with his people. Even before Judah even went into Babylonian captivity, I want you to notice what the Lord told them in Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31, and we'll go through verse 34. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. He says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people." And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, remember what we just read here in Jeremiah 31. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8 now. Hebrews chapter 8. Now, I want you to notice something that Paul is now talking about. I say Paul. I think that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. You can differ with me on that. That's okay. But this is what he said of this new covenant that Jeremiah spoke of. 
Hebrews chapter 8, let's look at verse 7 through 13. It says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, and then he, notice he quotes Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. And then notice his conclusion in verse 13. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which is decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now as we have seen, a covenant contains certain terms. A covenant is simply a contract between two or more parties. All parties are bound equally to that contract. As Paul said in Galatians 3.15, If it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. It has to be honored. You have to keep the words of the covenant, Deuteronomy 29, verse 9, and it can't, you cannot take from it. You can't add to it, as Paul said there in Galatians 3.15. But all of the covenants that God ever made with people can be actually lumped together into two main covenants. We're talking about the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. As I said earlier, we commonly know these as the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, as was read in our scripture reading, Paul allegorized these two covenants with the two children, two sons of Abraham. The one, Isaac, the son of promise, and the other, the son of Hagar, who was Ishmael. Now, let's jump to Hebrews chapter 10. And what I want you to notice, here in the book of Hebrews, the inspired writer here emphasizes the superiority of the new covenant. He does this all throughout the book of Hebrews. But I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 through 23. He says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He's talking about Jesus. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, talking about Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Does that sound a little bit familiar? We've already seen it twice. Now, where remission of these is, there's no offering, more offering for sin. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he that is, he is faithful that promised. Now these are the two main covenants of the Bible that the Bible actually deals with. One was for Israel, that's the Old Testament. The law of Moses was specific, specifically to the nation of Israel. And the other one deals with everybody else. It deals with us today. We're talking about the new covenant now, I want to notice these two new covenants. You see one that's old, one that's new. And we're going to go ahead and remain in the book of Hebrews from here on out for the most part. Now, many people, they try to lump these two covenants together. But the Bible makes a distinction tween, between them, and it demands a separation. Now, let's notice the contrast between these two covenants. In Hebrews 8, verse 13, they are described as the old and the new. This is not necess necessarily a designation of age, but rather that one is called old because of the termination of its conditions and its compensations. The word new comes from the Greek word kainos. It means something that is totally brand new, something never before seen. And therefore, we recognize two totally separate covenants. They are not to be mixed. 
In Hebrews 10, verse 9, they are distinguished as the first and the second. If people try to combine them today and lump them as the one, then you can't make that distinction. A second cannot be made without a separation first from the first one. Now, another thing about these two covenants, one was made by Moses, John 1.17. The other one was made by Christ, Hebrews 12.24. Moses, of course, was the mediator of the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is the mediator of the New Testament. One was interceded by man. The other was interceded by God. One was also considered as a shadow, Hebrews 10, verse 1. The other one is the, uh, described as the true, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Now, to kind of describe what the writer is talking about here when he talks about a shadow, let's take, for example, let's say you're going downtown Corpus Christi. In its late evening, blue, clear sky. The sun is still up just a little bit, but it's low on the horizon. And you're walking north on the street, and you're walking on the left-hand side of the road. And there happens to be a building right there on the corner. As you're walking up to that corner, all of a sudden you see a shadow on the ground of a person coming to you. Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to kind of swing wide to the right so you will avoid a collision because you see that there is a person coming. Now, that shadow on the ground is not the person himself, but it is something that the real substance has cast on the ground to let you know that there's somebody just around the corner. So the first thing you would see would be the shadow, not the person. This is the way that Paul describes the old law. It is a shadow. Uh, it was the first to be seen, but it's not the true substance. The new law is the true substance that actually follows the shadow. As Paul said there in Hebrews 10:1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. Here's something else to distinguish between the new and the old. One was dedicated by the blood of animals, but the new was dedicated by none other than the blood of Christ. Look at Hebrews 9 in verses 12 through 14. Hebrews 9, verses 12 through 14. There it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal, eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify through the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away one single sin, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. But by the blood of Christ, we now have forgiveness, Hebrews 9, 28. Here's another distinction. Under the old law, there were divers' washings, as we see in Hebrews 9, 10. But under the new covenant, there is only one washing, and that is our sins being washed away through the act of baptism. And that's found in Hebrews 10, 22 and Acts 22, 16. Under the old law, there was no forgiveness of sins. In other words, that forgiveness that it spoke of was actually in prospect. But their sins were remembered year after year, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 3. But under the new law, there is no more remembrance of sins, Hebrews 10, 17. Under the old law, there was a continual changing of priests, and it was because they were men, they were mortal, and they died because of death, Hebrews 7.23. But under the new, Jesus has an unchangeable priesthood because he continueth forever, Hebrews 7.24. Now remember, because there was a change of priesthood, it necessitated a change of law, Hebrews 7, verse 12. And the reason Jesus could not be a priest while he lived on this earth is because he sprang out of the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood, Hebrews 7, verse 14. So while he was on this earth and under the law of Moses, he could not be a priest. In order for him to be a priest, the law had to change. Under the old law, 
they observe the Sabbath day, Exodus 20, verse 8. But under the new law, we observe a new day. We observe the Lord's day, the first day of the week, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. And that old law was temporal. It was only intended to be our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, Galatians 3, 24, whereas the new law is eternal because it lives and abides forever, 1 Peter 1, verse 23. So as you can see, these two laws are completely different from one another, and therefore we have to make a decision on which one we're going to serve. We need to serve the better, and we need to serve the eternal covenant, the one ratified by Christ. And we do this because of the superiority of this new covenant. Now, the new covenant was certainly superior to the old covenant, just like Christ is superior to Moses. Long ago, Moses said this in Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among, them, uh, from among their brethren like unto me, thee, talking to Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now, if we were just left with this verse, we would probably still be scratching our head and wondering who is that prophet that they're talking about. But the good thing about having the new law, the New Testament, we're told who this prophet is. Stephen informed those Jews who slew him that Jesus was the prophet that Moses related to the children of Israel, seen there in Acts 7, verse 37 and following. The new prophet was superior to Moses. Uh, he also gave a superior covenant, and it was built upon better promises. The new covenant is also superior because it is dedicated by the blood of Christ and not by the blood of animals, Hebrews 9, verse 19 through 28. It's superior because under the new covenant, our sins are remembered no more, Hebrews 10, verses 9 through 22. But under the old law, they were remembered year after year. This new covenant is also superior because it offers eternal inheritance rather than temporal inheritance. It's an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, one that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, 1 Peter 1, verse 4. In fact, this new covenant is better in every way. By it we obtain a better hope, Hebrews 7, verse 19. Jesus Christ is now our surety under that new covenant, Hebrews 7, 22. It's established upon better promises, Hebrews 8, verse 6. It's ratified by better sacrifices, Hebrews 9, 23. It provides a better and an enduring substance, Hebrews 10, 34. And with this new covenant, we obtain a better resurrection, Hebrews 11, verse 35. So the evidence is quite clear. We have to make a distinguishing, a, a distinguishing difference between the first and the second, between the old and the new, between the inferior and the superior. Jesus took that old covenant because it had faults with it. And he took it and he nailed it to his cross, taking it out of the way, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. So Jesus rendered that old law ineffective and inoperable. And so it's no wonder then that Paul tells us that anybody who tries to go back to that old law, to the Old Testament, try to justify what they do today who live under the new covenant, then they have fallen from grace, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. So if you want eternal life, you have to abide by the new law, the New Testament, not the Old Testament. That Old Testament was beneficial for us. It was written for our learning, our admonition, our example, but it's not our law. That was a totally different law given simply to the nation of Israel. We have to abide by the New Testament law. And this is what the New Testament says that we have to do in order to obtain eternal life. We first have to believe in Jesus Christ, that he is who he claimed to be, that he is the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh, and that he was the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. And if we don't believe that, then we're going to die in our sins, John chapter 8, verse 24. We also have to confess that very faith before men and not be ashamed, Matthew 10, 32. We must repent of our sins and be baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It's then that we are added to the church of our Lord, the one and only church, 
the body of the saved, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. It's only done through obedience. And notice all the covenants that God made with mankind, our obedience is demanded. If we want to be in a covenant relationship with God, we have to obey what he says. If you're not a child of God, won't you become one this morning? If you are, and maybe you've strayed away from your duty, and you have not been faithful to that covenant that God has made, then we encourage you to repent of that. If there's anything that we can help you with, whatever it may be, maybe you need the prayers of the congregation to give you strength and encouragement, we'd be glad to do that. Once you respond to the invitation this morning, while together we stand and sing.